if we go and establish a new protected area and Hailu is certainly in discussions right now to do that thing, what are you conserving for example? Speak loudly so the mic can pick it up. Okay, thank you very much. Loud, loud, very loud. Okay. In fact, come closer. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll come there. What are the conservation priorities of this conservation area that you're planning to implement? Yeah, the conservation priority for this area is we have uh, special two endemic animals, which is which ones? Uh, red fox, which were already seen in Bali Mountain. At the same time, baboon, which is okay. endemic to Ethiopia. So we are targeted. Which baboon? Chalada uh, baboon. Okay. These are the target species. At the same time. We are targeting for the ecosystem because that area is the source of water for a lot of people. Okay, so it sounds like in this protected area, we are trying to conserve two animal species and a forest that serves as a water tower. Who decided? The community? Outside practitioners? Whose voices were prioritized over others? Should we conserve because it is simply there? or because it has some value. Now if it has some value, who is inferring that value? Not everyone values everything the same way, right? Do we prioritize on endemicity? Hailu is certainly suggesting that yeah, we have to, right? The baboons and, and red wolf, right? So what might begin with a conservation project that is interested in a forest broadly defined and two animals is that what we will conserve for in 40 years time that very same thing <laughs> are we conserving for those same things 40 years from now what do you guys think Keep it, keep it, I'll come back. Okay. Here's another thing to think about when it comes to integrity. Once the threshold has been reached, however one defines that threshold, do we stop conserving? How many elephants does it take to stop conserving? Or to become lax in our enforcement? Or to shift our priorities elsewhere? These are questions that undoubtedly will come to bear on the future of conservation and we're simply not talking about them at this point. You know, at what point should conservation stop? Here's another one. What's considered as a conservation success story and when it comes to integrity? More red wolves? Would that be a conservation success story? From 250 to, to 300 to 1,000? What's the carrying capacity of the red wolf? What about when the red wolf have eaten all the, the mole rats? We're not thinking about these things. Second one, changes in how the species is to be conserved. If you want to protect that forest that Hailu is talking about, do you have an electric fence all around it? Or do you have community forest guardians? Can community forest gardens become co-opted? Can they become corrupted? Do we rely on heavily armed rangers or community scouts? Depends on what was causing the problem. And so it's very much dependent on these historical and ongoing threats. And that's why it's important to think about what that scenario might be, not five years out, not ten years out, but maybe forty years out. How, how do we conserve species that are migratory? How do you conserve 1.3 million migratory wildebeest? How do you conserve migratory birds? Do you have islands of forests? Or do you have a single large forest? If you have a single large forest, Maybe there might be multiple competing threats to reduce the size of that forest. What if you had many little islands of forests? Depends on which birds. 
what resources are available for conservation at time one versus time two. Now this is particularly difficult and I talk about it because the government the state shifts its allocation of resources from time to time in relation to external political threats. This is a big one that we've encountered. Ben. Yeah, uh, I think can we go back to the first to the previous slide? Yeah, I think there's a very serious question that I that I've planned to ask before we go. Okay. And uh, this is one reason why conservation of protected areas is always on paper and it can be achieved in most African countries, it be worldwide. And there are two major challenges we always face. One is capacity in terms of human resources, maybe rangers or whatever, and the financial support. Coming to that. Yeah. It's, so I hope it's number three and four. All right. Yeah. You can address yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. They're really good points, so. Can you repeat the points that I'm back in here? One is of funding, roughly, and human resources that Ben would like us to think a little bit more about in terms of intent. Okay. Changes in the legal status of protected areas, right? So IUCN has very nicely categorized us for us eight different types of protected areas. I think that's the wrong approach because there are so many more than those eight categories and they are constantly evolving. Their boundaries are constantly shifting, right? When you takes this great deal of environmental complexity, environmental and social complexity, and you re simply reduce it down to one of eight categories, you miss out a lot. There's ambiguity surrounding the legality of particular land claims, and we clearly saw that. Whether we were in the forest or whether we were in the savannah, we saw that. There are claims and counterclaims by politicians, local peoples, and civic groups. Remember, one of the things I said on the bus is that conservation politics are also local politics and national politics. It is impossible to isolate those. And conservation and land claims can get hijacked for political purposes. We certainly see that not only here, but everywhere, including in the US. And we need to, so if we're going to move forward in planning for conservation, you've got to clarify what the land tenure claims are. You don't do that, you're going to have the same sets of problems as you have right now. And clearly with, uh, with the, I'm forgetting the names of those, those parks, but the, first, the, 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 the second national park that we went to, Abhijata Sala, right? You can see that the impact of, the, the, the human impact there was clearly a product of unclear land tenure claims, okay? And are these claims rooted in customary law? Do, how do we like reconcile between something that is a legally gazetted thing, where at the same time the national constitution will acknowledge that, they are, that we have to incorporate customary law at the same time? It's incredibly difficult. And most of all, I think we have to respect human rights here. Changes in overall funding. Once particular metrics have been reached, and so you know, we can think about uh, Bale here in Frankfurt Zoological and the fact that there are 250 to 300 red wolves. Maybe their conservation prior, it would be very interesting to go and look at their public, uh, publicly available fi files for what they constitute as success. And maybe that means an overall increase in the number of animals by 10%, 20%, 30%. Is that what might be considered a success? Donors are not loyal. Conservation organizations are not loyal. They will come and go. There's been one program after another where one leaves, another picks up, right? And they have to establish new priorities in line with their board and with their funding partners. One of the key elements of conservation funding is that you rely on the stock market as the primary funding mechanism for rich individuals to donate. When the stock market's bad, they don't like funding conservation, right? And if we take the case of the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program, a new partner, Frankfurt Zoological, comes in in 2005. 
in all of our discussions yesterday and today in Bali, we never asked what was happening prior to 2005. Right? We automatically assumed that since Frankfurt Zoological was there, okay, good. Nice big European Union sign on the side of the vehicle. Right? Changes in the funding lines, particular funding for particular things. Funding for monitoring is often provided, but not capital expenses for infrastructure. So when you look at the park headquarters, there was some infrastructure but certainly not a lot of it, right? There's an over-reliance on foreign experts and local guides. I like the terminology here. The foreigners are the experts, the locals are the guides, right? There's a way by which we need to think about bringing in guides for the long term who then become experts, right? Rather than simply reducing local guides to that role of guide. One of the things we've heard repeatedly is that we have a five-year management plan. We have a 10-year management plan, as though that is the key to conservation integrity. These are often the first things to be funded. When a new donor comes in, what do they say? All right, we'll fund you to develop a five-year management plan. And sometimes people follow the management plan regardless of the thought that was put into it. And they simply defer it to say, well, it was in the management plan. Therefore, we must do it while circumstances are changing. And this is often historically decontextualized, right? There's no mention of the history of these things. And that's really important. The lack of planning and guidance. So while there is the management plan on the one hand, you know, these bigger questions, like who sets biodiversity values, who guides it, and who actually does it, these are not actually discussions that are had in country. Sometimes these decisions are made in London, Paris, Oslo, wherever. Climate change. The, it's really important as you go back to your respective countries, look at the way they have identified climate change in part of protected area management. Is, it, is climate change considered a threat? Is it considered an opportunity? Is it considered a funding opportunity? These are things that we're not really thinking about. There's again reliance on foreign experts. And here one solution to think about in that in terms of the integrity for the long term is the need to build local capacity at all levels. Not just those who have formal university education. Right? From school groups to advanced specialized training. And I think the biggest investment that a, that a country, a county, a local government can make is in education and to acknowledge multiple viewpoints and not provide a singular view of what conservation is because that is false. Changes in administration. There's high rotation among senior officials. They come and go. Rangers and other park guards are frequently rotated. Right? And that's because, if you are a cynic, like me, you'll say that this is because people don't want to be comfortable in one position. The, all the overall administration doesn't want people to be comfortable in the long term for a particular position. You have to rotate. So while you might be posted to Bali, and then you go to um, Simeon, and then you go to Gambela, and then you go to Nekisar, whatever. Different rangers, different wardens are posted to different areas. And doing that means it's really difficult to understand the rough and tumble of what is happening locally on the ground. It's hard for rangers who don't, are not familiar with the area and practice nature conservation in a very strict way to actually understand what we think of as the rough and tumble of everyday livelihood and politics. And as a result, people's complex social, socio-environmental practices are reduced down to singular identities. Herders overgrazing. Peasants, deforesters. You're taking an incredibly complex livelihood and you're simply reducing it down.